Well, hello. Thank you for being here. It's really hard because it's the afternoon and after lunch, and so please feel free to stand up and move around and uh, do what you need to do to stay awake. I know it is hard in the, in the afternoon. Um, I guess I want to start just by saying that um, most of what you're going to see here comes from the research of John Gottman. So we didn't cite him. You'd just be seeing his name splattered throughout the slides. So just so you know, most of what you're going to see is coming from John Gottman's research. Um, I think Josh said it in 2006. I was at a training uh, that presented some of the Gottman material. And I remember being fascinated by it, going through training myself and bringing it back to the clinic that I was working at. And I was so surprised by the success rate. And so Jeff and I, we have incorporated it into our own lives, but as we were developing workshops and whatnot for, for couples, we realized that no matter what we were doing, we kept coming back to Gottman stuff. So we ended up just going and getting trained for certain, uh, the, the workshop that they do based on his book, which is The Seven Principles. And uh, a lot of what you're going to see um, here is, is from that as well. It's a, pe a piece of the big picture. So my husband actually is, we just moved. We just emptied our U-Haul right before we came here. <laughs> and so he's got a little bit of a back problem. So he's getting relief. And so he's going to do a little of the presenting. And I'm going to kind of wing most of it. And uh, then he's going to join me back in the end. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to him right now. And then I'll, I'll come back on in just a minute. So I am going to stay on the stage so that uh, I can poke her in the back if I feel like she needs to add something, or I, I can chime in. But uh, this is going to be awkward. So we're just going to start off with why do we experience conflict? Um, Kathy's going to talk about how in the world it can deepen intimacy, but I'm going to start with why we experience it. So conflict can be, I did something wrong, and I don't want to admit it. You did something wrong, and I want to tell you about it. Or, uh, I don't like what's going on, and you need to change it. Um, we experience a lot of conflict because of things that we can't change, necessarily. Beliefs and values, culture, uh, family of origin stuff, life experiences, the way we grew up, uh, how we view the world and our relationships. Uh, the Gottmans found that almost 69%, almost 70, of the conflict that we experience in marriage is unresolvable. It doesn't mean it's unmanageable. It just means that it's going to recur. And uh, we're hoping today to show you maybe a tool that uh, that can help you to to manage that conflict. Uh, one other item, differences in how you do conflict can cause conflict. Um, she and I have very different uh, ways of dealing with conflict. I'd prefer not to have any. <laughs> and uh, she thrives on it. And I have been continually amazed in our marriage where we can have what to me feels like an awful conflict and five minutes later she's being lovey because she feels like we had a great, a great conflict. And so, so I've learned that if I use the tools that, that we're talking about, it's a signal to her that this is a big deal to me because I'm taking the steps to to initiate what could be a conflict for me. I want to move forward one slide here. So um, the, the, uh, all those things, the culture and the beliefs and the values, family of origin, life experiences, they all come together to create uh, a life map uh, of who you are. And uh, when the two of you come together as a couple, you both have these different ways. I, I was thinking about it. It's like having a map 
to Christmas. Here we are in September, and if I was to ask some of you, how do you get to Christmas from here? You would say, well, next week I'm going to be start shopping for Uncle Joe, and over the next two months I will have purchased all my Christmas presents, and as soon as Thanksgiving is over, the lights are up, or maybe even before, and uh, for us, others of you, your map, your directions to get to Christmas are, you don't even start driving towards Christmas until about a week ahead of time. So you both have very different directions on how to get to Christmas, and it causes conflict. But if you can, if you can sit down and talk through these things, you can develop your own set of directions together about how to get to Christmas. So the last thing I want to say from, from my part is uh, some of you may be sitting out there and have experienced a big break in trust or a big, big betrayal. And uh, I know that after something like that, it feels like every argument is about that. Every conflict is about that, that awful betrayal, that awful break in trust. And you don't see how you can begin to rebuild those things. And this, this, the ability to handle conflict well in little things can give you the opportunity to begin to rebuild that trust, to look past that betrayal and, and see a way out of, that, out of that big betrayal, that big conflict. So how can you do this? How can conflict deepen intimacy? And then you're going to hand it over. All righty. I like the Christmas idea. That was good. That was new. So the Latin word for confrontation, conflict confrontation, actually means to turn toward. So I'm, we're going to look face to face. And to use a Gottman term, turn toward, actually, when you, when you do the research, when you, when you listen to Gottman talking, he says that to turn toward means that in any given moment, I'm going to decide to act in the positive rather than maybe neutrally or negatively. So he calls them sliding door moments. Um, there's more to this, but we're going to shorten it a little bit here. So when we know that we have to approach a conflict, or we know that something has happened and we need to talk about it, it's important to realize that coming at it from a positive point of view rather than a negative view is, is going to be helpful. And in everyday things, when we have the opportunity to respond to our spouse or to others, if we remember that a positive turning towards rather than a negative turning towards or a neutral is going to create more trust, it's going to create more connection. Um, when we, how do, you know, if, if you're thinking about how does conflict deepen intimacy, most people that I talk to say, okay, it feels terrible. How are we going to do this? It doesn't feel good. How does that create closeness? Because usually it just drives us further away. So how is it supposed to do that? Well, um, confrontation is actually supposed to preserve love. And the way it does it is by protecting the relationship from elements that would harm it and then putting it in place, putting in place those things that make relationships thrive. So do we have gardeners here? flower, vegetable, does anybody like to garden at all? A few people. So if you think of it that way, um, if, if your relationship is like a garden, you're going to protect it like a garden. You protect it from disease or mold or insects or those kind of things, right? And you're going to have to do something about that. You have to decide what you're going to do about this, protecting this, your garden. And then you're going to put things in place like fertilizer or sunshine or water, those are the good things that you put into it. And that's exactly what we're doing when we're confronting is we're trying to preserve love. We're trying to put good things in and, and protect it from things that are going to harm it. So we have to have the conflict discussions. We can't avoid them. It actually, avoiding conflict makes us absorb more negativity in our relationship. So to actually talk about it is going to be better in the long run. Um, it doesn't feel good, right? 
it, it makes us feel like we're, we're going apart. But actually, what we're gonna show you is a few tools on how to manage conflict and what we're hoping it's gonna do, what it does when it's managed well, is you start having a deeper understanding of your spouse. I'm starting to understand you more. I'm slowing down, kind of Brad, if you guys were here for Brad's, slowing down, listening, I'm going to understand my spouse more. Um, so I'm gonna have a deeper understanding of, of each person. And that's gonna lead to a deeper understanding of the relationship. If I know Jeff, if I have a deeper understanding of Jeff, and he has a deeper understanding of me and my internal workings, we're gonna have a much better understanding about our relationship. And that's gonna to lead to a deeper connection and a trust. We're gonna feel more at ease with each other. We're gonna feel like, okay, you got my back, I got your back. And that's gonna to lead to a deeper and more meaningful marriage. And as we know, if you have a good and meaningful marriage, it's gonna spill over into your family and your other relationships. And so thereby you are creating deeper, creating deeper intimacy. You are going to create a better connection with yourself and with your family. Key elements, and we're gonna come back to these in just a minute, we're gonna do these specifically. Keeping the goal in mind, staying clear of relationship killers all the time, but especially in conflict. Knowing how to start softly, how to start these discussions is, is very important. Um, listening to understand and know when and how to take a break. Okay, so one of the very important things to know about when couples are in conflict is it's usually not about what you're fighting about. So if this couple was in my office, or if we were gonna, if Jeff and I were gonna have a conversation with this couple, we would probably find out that it's really not about the toilet paper roll, it's probably not about the cup in the sink, it's really not about the fact that somebody watched a movie before the other person. It's probably really about something a little bit more meaningful. So the key foundational principle here is that behind all those emotions, requests, longings, is one thing that you'll want to discover, and that's what that deeper meaning is, or what that dream is underneath. Um, so for instance, with this little couple, we might actually talk to them and find out, you know, it's not about the toilet paper roll. It might be about the fact that she lived in a very chaotic environment in her life, or he did and order is very important to them. Or it's not about the fact that you watched the movie before me, but I had an ex-spouse who used to run off all the time and do things, and being together is very important to me. Um, there's usually something underneath. So it's especially true for Jeff and I. I am the emotive one, he wasn't kidding. He's gonna, he's gonna try to avoid conflict because peace is more important to him than anything on the planet. And I'm like, let's talk about it. Let's get it over with, what's going on? That's, you know, okay, well, something's wrong here, so let's talk about it. Or I'm gonna emote because I'm, cause that's me. And what he's learned is that if I've got a really high, intense reaction to something, it's probably not about what we were just arguing about. It's probably something a little bit more meaningful. It's not gonna be about the toilet paper roll or the U-Haul boxes or those kind of things. Like for instance, lately we just had to move and move from what was my dream house and for other circumstances we had to, we had to move and downsize and left the woods and the deer and I've been pretty prickly. And he knows it's not about the fact that I, the box was in the wrong place or that the, you know, certain thing didn't happen at this time. It's really about the fact that I'm grieving the loss of my home. And so he's understanding there's a deeper meaning under there. So you have a spouse who's reacting really, really intensely. One of the responsibilities you can have as the listener of this is to say, okay, Brad had a great, I'm so glad that you were first because you kind of set this all up for us. That, okay, I'm gonna step back. I'm gonna realize this probably isn't about me or about what's going on. I'm going to discover what it's really about. And as the speaker, the person that's going to approach the conflict, I kind of have a responsibility to maybe, before I bring something up with Jeff, to sit back and say, okay, I've been really prickly about this and this and this, and this is really irritating me. What is this really about? And kind of figure that out before I even approach him. That's an important thing to realize. It's kind of depersonalizing it. I'm gonna let this be about 
my spouse, not about me, even if I'm the one pointing the finger at him, if I'm doing it incorrectly and I'm blaming him for something, um, it, it's really important for him to be able to calm me down by saying, okay, what is this about? Let's talk. Because he knows it's not necessarily about that. So keep the goal in mind. So we know that there's something bigger underneath. We also have to keep in mind, what is your goal? So we are in it together. Um, and, and there can be a lot of things that you can do to keep that in mind. You can have a conversation about what are we doing here? Where do we want to go? Where do we want to be? What's our kind of marital mission statement? Uh, you know, our goal is we want to do life together. You know, I heard a great, I wish I had, had gotten it written down, but um, Susan Sarandon, Richard Gere, and Shall We Dance? She does a wonderful quote about being the witness to your life. You know, having somebody that is a witness to your life, who walks through your life and knows you and understands you and you do this together. So keeping that in mind will help, even when things get hard and when you have a lot of conflict, understanding our goal together is to get from point A to point B and keep that in mind, whatever that is for you guys. We're doing it as a we, not as two me's. So what to avoid? Um, the relationship killers are the things that you want to avoid. And uh, Gottman calls them the four horsemen of the apocalypse. How many people here even know of Gottman? Okay, several people do, so that's good. So you've heard this before. So there are four things that you want to avoid when you're gonna approach um, somebody in a conflict discussion. One is contempt. So contempt is basically, I'm superior and I'm going to make sure that my spouse knows it. And I might hear things like coming out of my mouth like, I would never do that to you. Or uh, I might call him a name and belittle him and uh, make sure that he is put in his place. So that is contempt. Um, versus describing how I'm doing about it. It's not about him, it's about me being able to say, I am feeling uncomfortable with what's going on, rather than trying to put him down. So I'm gonna take responsibility for what's going on with me. Defensiveness is the other one. I hear this all the time. I hear this coming out of my own mouth or in my own head. Um, so when I, well, I'll switch around because it would probably be more this way anyway. Jeff might approach me with a, with a problem and let's just say he didn't do it very well. Let's just say he said, you're always leaving you know, dishes out everywhere. And, and I'm just really, I, that's just really, I just don't want you to do that. So he did it wrong, first of all. But it doesn't matter, because I still have responsibility in how I'm going to respond. So I might respond with me. Waha, I'm not the only one that leaves dishes around here. I mean, you did it yesterday. I picked up your mug, and the kids are doing it all the time. So why are you talking about me? So that's defensiveness. Um, whenever you watch co uh, couples in conflict, you see this a lot. It's like a ping pong match, right? It's like, well, you did that, well, you did that, while well, you did this, while well, you, and it just goes back and forth and back and forth, and nothing gets resolved. It's just a big, it just goes round and round and round. So the, the antidote to that is taking personal responsibility, which is really hard to do when you're, when you're feeling defensive. But he might approach me with the dishes, and I have to, again, take those few moments to stop and say, okay, what part of this is true? I do leave my dishes out all the time. Okay, I, you're right. You know what, you're right, I do. I leave my dishes out. Um, and even that step is going to help the conversation go in a more positive manner. Criticism is the other killer. So that's when I start attributing things that are going wrong to a character deficit in Jeff instead of talking about behavior or actions. So I've just character assassinated him name calling or those kind of things. You might hear that. Um, actually, there was a couple where the woman worked full time and the husband had been out of work and she came home and she started immediately just calling him lazy bum. What do you think you're doing? You're, you're good for nothing. You're worthless. You're not doing anything around here. Um, that's criticism. You know, do you think he's going to be motivated to help her? Probably not. So the antidote to that is starting softly, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. So stonewalling. <laughs> so I, I kind of fit once in a while in those top three. I have to be really careful of those top three. 
and, and Jeff is the stonewaller. So if you saw somebody stonewalling, they're basically just checking out. So I'm not gonna participate in this at all. So if you, so if Jeff was stonewalling, he's gonna sit there kind of wide-eyed like deer in the headlights. And if you could see the bubble, you know, like in cartoons and stuff where you see the little bubble about what they think, his little bubble would say something like, okay, just sit still, she'll quit in a minute. She's gonna quit any time now, don't move she's gonna stop, right? That's what you're gonna see in the bubble and in somebody who's stonewalling. And the antidote to that is self-soothing. Like I said, we're gonna talk about some of that in, a, in just a little bit. So soften startup. This is really important because um, what our research has shown is that when a discussion starts negatively, it's gonna end negatively. So how you initiate a conversation is going to tell you pretty much whether it's got a chance of being successful. So you want to go gently. You want to be able to think about the conflict discussion before you bring it up. So if there's an event that happens immediately and you're having a really strong reaction about it, that's probably not the time to bring it up because things are gonna happen and you're gonna say things that you probably don't think or feel or mean. So you want to give it a little bit of time, and you can even warn the person. So Jeff is really good about this because I'm a reactor. So he's really good about saying that he needs to talk to me about something. And then I can prepare for it. So I, we actually just talked about this too. I, I don't mind if he says, can you make some time on Thursday because I have something to talk to you about. So I know, okay. On Thursday, I have to make sure I'm clear and get rid of all the garbage and stuff going on in my head and be prepared to listen to something that he has to say. It's way better for me. If he's gonna bring something up in the moment, who knows what he's gonna get back. So, so preparing is not a, it's not a bad thing. When you talk, when you're having a discussion with somebody, and you've decided you're gonna wait and you're gonna bring it up slowly, you're gonna bring it up gently, there are four elements to this that are gonna help you achieve a successful outcome. The four elements in this discussion are gonna be the event or the action that took place. So we're not talking about the character, right? Because we're not gonna go to the four horsemen. We're talking about just the event or the action that took place, what emotions that that conjured up at the time, what the deeper meaning is for you, because hopefully you've thought about it a little bit and you kind of understand, you know, what was my belief? What was, what was going on? Where did that come from? Did that have something to do with my childhood? Did that have a way to, you know, something to do with the way I grew up? I have a, a better concept of what that means to me, right? It's not about what happened, it's more about the deeper meaning. And then I'm gonna have a request for change. So, what that might be is, so this is an actual event <laughs> um, that we're gonna share with you. It's, it's tweaked a little bit. We're gonna tell you a little bit more about it um, towards the end of our discussion here. So the event is, my wife keeps stashing away money instead of adding it to the budget. I can't get a good grasp on her spending when she does that. So that's what the event is, it's pretty factual. And he's not saying this to me, this is just kind of what he's thinking about right now. Okay, what are my feelings? I was frustrated and a little bit angry. Um, what, what is the deeper meaning in this? Um, I think of myself as failing when I can't get our finances stabilized. Failure is kind of a trigger for me. I also value unity in this area. That's pretty significant marriage. I want us to be a team in this. I don't want to do this solo. I want to share this um, with, my, with my wife. Um, if you were going to do this wrong, um, most people stop at event and feelings, and they don't do the next two. Most people will say, this is what happened and here's how I felt. And so what happens is when they have that conflict discussion with their spouse, it might be, uh, gosh, why do you keep doing that? Um, how can I keep things straight when you're constantly messing them up? Um, or accusing, or uh, you're not gonna get a very good response, right? Because you're, you're only getting the first two parts. You do this and it makes me mad. So you wanna, you wanna make sure that you do the next two things. The request is, what is it that you really want out of this? Do you want to win? <laughs> or, or do you really want something that takes you to the next step of, of deeper intimacy and doing things together? So 
in this case, it's I'd like for my wife to give input into the budget and stop stashing money so that we can create a workable budget for our family. So if So the wrong way you might do that would be, uh, could you just please tell me when you spend money as the request? So you may, you may only skip the deeper meaning. You probably will make some kind of request, but it won't be very deep and it, it may backfire on you. Good one. <laughs> okay. So here is a sample of what he might, what Jeff might say to me in this, in this circumstance. He might say, when money is not, we're going to do the real thing. <laughs> when money is not added to the budget and stashed away here and there, that's the, that's the event. I get really frustrated and sometimes pretty impatient and angry, okay? because it creates feelings of failure for me that I can't get a handle on creating a stable budget for our family. And I also want something as important as money to be something we create together. So if you want to look at this a little different way, what he's doing is he is representing or speaking for his feelings. He's not becoming them. And he's pretty good at that. I have to work on that. I want to re represent my feelings. I want to speak for my feelings. I don't necessarily want to become them and have him step back because I, you know, I'm just all about my feelings. So his request might be, I'm hoping that you'll take a look at the budget and give me some ideas on how it might work for you so that you won't feel like you need to stash aside money. This is just an idea. You're gonna hear the actual one in, in a little bit because we're gonna actually do this for you. We're gonna get through some stuff and if there's time, we're gonna show you how this works. We know what we're gonna talk about. We don't know what each other is going to say. <laughs> so it could be really fun. We might want to cut the video at that time, too. <laughs> I don't know if I want all my personal stuff out there for everybody. OK, so listening is the, the next key element. And we, we've heard a lot about listening. If you've been in therapy, you, you know about listening. If you've read books, you've, you've read about how to listen. Um, but really, there's, there are some key elements in the key element of listening. So, what you're wanting to do is to understand your spouse's perspective. You don't have to agree with it. You just want to listen and understand. Get that, that deeper meaning, right? We're trying to build connection and trust here. I'm going to stop. I'm just going to let my spouse talk, and I'm going to try to get their perspective. I want to know that deeper meaning. I want to make sure that he feels secure and understood, because once he feels secure and understood, he's going to listen to me. If I keep interrupting him, He's going to keep fighting for his position and his perspective. But if I let him just sit and talk and then help to make sure he knows that I understood what he's talking about, remember, I don't have to agree with it. I'm just getting the understanding. He's going to feel better. He's going to be willing to listen to me. And that's going to build trust in our relationship. So I'm not going to interrupt. I'm right. I'm not going to have the four horsemen. Um, when I'm able to talk, when I'm able to respond to him, I'm going to take 100% responsibility for my part, no matter how small that is. I'm going to talk about that just a little bit later. Um, I'm not going to change subjects or go off topic, um, and I'm not going to formulate my rebuttal while he's talking. I'm going to be fully actively trying to understand what he's saying. And what I, I think the, the best way to view this is I'm an investigative reporter. So again, Brad is talking about stepping back and he was, you know, he was talking about you have this, this time to decide. He has like a three second window, right? Something like that where you're gonna decide what you can do or not do. Or Gottman would say that's your sliding door moment. What are you gonna do? And so it's very important that I'm going to step back and I'm going to listen to him and he's going to talk about all of his stuff and my job is to clarify. I'm the investigative reporter. I need to get an accurate story here and the only way I'm going to get an accurate story is to ask questions and clarify and then not have any of my own emotions in it, right? I'm a reporter, so I'm, I don't get my opinion in this. This is just simply understanding who my spouse is. So that's the point. And keep going. So, uh, especially if you have trouble deciding what your deeper meaning is, 
you may need to have, your spouse may need to draw it out of you. Uh, she's really good at that, at, at poking at me until I get down farther into a deeper meaning because I don't want to go there. And she wants me to hold the mic, and I'm not going to because I'm done now. Because <laughs> he could do that because he has a voice and a choice of what he does. <laughs> no matter what I think. I don't have to agree with him, right? Okay. The next thing is knowing how and when to take a break. So we're gonna talk about flooding just a little bit. Um, when I did Gottman training, one of the most wonderful things I learned is this thing called diffuse physiological arousal, which is basically just, we call it flooding. Um, so we've had Stephanie Carnes and all these people who have had these great um, discussions about the brain and very, uh, very good um, discussions. And I'm gonna take it down to the eighth grade level <laughs> and not label the parts of the brain and tell you all about the limbic system and stuff. I'm just gonna come down to the eighth grade level and tell you this is what happens. <laughs> so you're in a conflict discussion and suddenly you are feeling what we might call a fight, flight, and free or freeze, but I, one of the trainings that I went to said it's kind of like having all three together, so you don't know what to do. Um, and what happens is it literally, research has shown, I'm not sure how they did it, but it shuts down the logical part of your brain. So you're in this flooding state. So, so if I were to measure things like heartbeat and blood pressure and flesh and all these physiological responses, I would see that they were elevated and intense. But I don't have that in my office. I don't hook people up to wires and, and try to figure that out. Um, but we can become pretty good at sensing when that's happening, especially if it's happening to ourselves. So I'm a flutter, and when I flood, I'm going to probably say things I don't mean, or I'm going to have an emotional reaction. If Jeff is flooding, it's really hard to tell because he just shuts down. That's where that stonewalling comes in. I can't tell, he's quiet. But if I were to measure all those things in his body, he would have the elevated heart rate and the, and the blood pressure and the things going on. So what happens is couples get in these discussions and they have this flooding that happens and they keep trying to have a conversation. And can you imagine what that's like? My, the logical part of my brain just shut down. So all I'm doing is feeling. I'm just feeling, 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 feeling. And because I've got this fight, flight, freeze going on and I don't know what to do with it. And so I'm just blah. And, or, or he's just sitting there with the deer in the headlights, waiting for it to stop. So there is something that you could do for that. I love the mindful, mindful stuff right before this. It so goes together. I hope you guys were at Browns too. You have to take a break. You absolutely have to take a break. Have to take a break. So here are the rules for taking a break. When you feel, and you, you know, you guys probably know, it's a feeling in your gut or that rising of something or you just know you're about, this is not going well and if it keeps going, something's gonna happen that's not good. So here's the rules for taking a break. You want a signal that allows your spouse to know that you need a break. We want that to be a nice signal, not a not nice signal. So, you know, the timeout signal is good. <laughs> Saying I need a break is good. Um, any of those things are okay. Uh, you need to relax or distract for 20 minutes to an hour so that all those things in your brain get back in sync. So I don't relax well, but I can distract. So I can call a friend, I can listen to music, I can watch something on TV, I can clean my house, I can do something to distract. Um, you can't replay in your mind the things that cause the flooding. So that's the hardest part of taking a break. So if I call a friend, I can't talk about what just happened. I have to talk about other things. If I distract, I have to do so, so that I'm not thinking about what just happened. Um, a lot of people and most people do relaxation exercises. So some of the mindful stuff that Brad just talked about, or um, if any of you have done any of the relaxation exercises, that there are so many out there that you can learn about to relax, go take a bath if that helps you. I have found that that doesn't work for me because I'll ruminate. So relaxing doesn't work very well for me. I have to go distract, I have to do something. So the first time I ever did this, the first time this ever happened after I learned what flooding was, 
I, it was late at night and I left my house and I drove to the nearest store, which was Walmart, and I went inside Walmart and I said, I'm gonna pretend that I have $200. I'm not going to use a calculator, and I'm going to walk around, and I have an hour to spend $200. What would I spend $200 on? And so I had, I hate math, and so I, I had to calculate in my head, and I had to prioritize what I was going to buy if I had to buy, spend $200 in an hour. And so it was nearly an hour, and I was done, and I stopped, and I started thinking about what just happened, and suddenly it was like, wow, I had a completely di different perspective. It was like, okay, maybe he didn't mean that. Maybe he meant this. I wonder if, okay, so when he said that, hmm. So when I went back, I, could, I, I was in a better frame of mind. I could actually bring it up, and lo and behold, the discussion ended successfully in 15 minutes. So it doesn't always work like that, but, but 20 minutes to an hour. The next rule is make it a given in your relationship that you're gonna to try to approach the subject again with your spouse within 24 hours. I know sometimes that doesn't work with your work schedules and whatnot. Try to make that a given that you know you're gonna come back. One of the things partners, spouses will say is, yeah, but if he or she takes a break, I don't know if they'll ever come back and talk about it again. And sometimes people will use the break as a way to get out of talking about it. So the given is, I'm going to come back, we're going to try this again in 24 hours, or, or soon. If you attempt to discuss it again and flooding occurs, try the break again, try to come back to it. If it's something that just keeps triggering a flooding response, you probably want to have a little bit of support. So go to a counselor, a clergy, or somebody that can help facilitate those conversations. So we're going to try this in front of you. <laughs> Uh, anybody got Kleenex? Because I'm a crier. So, oh well, I got my sleeve. I'm good. So, so we're going to take this budget discussion and try this. And the two things that we're going to show you, hopefully, because we don't always do it right either. Oh, bless you. Is um, mostly it's going to be the listening to understand, and the softened startup. And hopefully, you won't see the four horsemen if. If, and it'll probably be me. If you do, you can call it out if you want. John Gottman, when he's actually seeing clients and he sees the four horsemen, he has a bell on his desk and he'll ring the bell. <laughs> it's like to, to get him to stop. So um, hopefully you won't see that and, and hopefully we're gonna model a couple of these things so you can see how this works. We can stop the video now. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so, uh... I'm not very good at separating the event from the eventer <laughs> when, I, uh, when, I, when I try to bring things up. But uh, um, when, when I am uh, looking at our bank accounts and find out that uh, we have a big pot of money that I didn't know about that hasn't really been accounted for or budgeted. Uh, it really bothers me. Um, I feel like you don't trust me. Um, I feel a little betrayed uh, when that happens. Um, I'd really like it if we could uh, sit down together occasionally and uh, look at the budget and you know give every budget every dollar a job and some of those jobs are going to be fun and uh, I'd really like to be able to do that. Okay, so. This isn't necessarily about numbers or you feeling competent in this. This really has to do with it, it, it's making you feel bad because you're feeling like I'm not trusting you with money. So is that what it is? Uh, yes. In, in my previous marriage, I had complete control of money and was able to hide a lot of things, and I wish to be more transparent. 
And so to me, if you're not participating, it's, it's keeping me from being able to be, make sure that you know that I'm being transparent with our money, that I'm not, I'm not doing that. Does that, does that trigger you? I mean, it, by me kind of stashing money, does that make you feel like maybe I'm doing something I shouldn't, it doesn't do that at all? Okay, so, so what it is is you really need us to be on the same page for accountability for you and it, it makes you feel better because I'm trusting you. Mm -hmm. Like I'm not trying to do it myself or I'm not trying to hide something from you about what we're doing it together. It might be like... Uh Uh, I want you to feel like I want the best for you also. That you don't need to hide money for good things. That I want those good things too. You want to be able to take care of me. And you want me to feel like you've, you're taking care of me. Not in a paternalistic kind of way. I didn't mean it paternally. <laughs> I meant in a husband way. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so do you feel like I get it? Do you feel like I understand? Is there something I'm missing? For the purposes of this exercise, <laughs> yes. <laughs> like you Is there something in a sentence or two you can add that would help me? Uh, no, I think you get it, yeah. Okay. Okay, so... When you, <laughs> thanks. Um, so when you approach me about the budget or when the, when the subject of money comes, oh my goodness, gosh. <laughs> when the subject of money comes up, uh, it produces a lot of anxiety for me and probably fear because in my previous marriage, that was so, that was used as control and manipulation and I felt like I had to so for years and years and years I have felt like I it, it, It's a safety issue. I have I have to do this because Otherwise this is going to go bad And so I'm kind of projecting that onto you um, My deeper meaning is is that the fear in my history and the fear of money and the fear of not being taken care of. And really, you've done nothing to, to show me that. It's kind of my own issue. So I, I guess what I would need from you is to very gently lead me to having those discussions. So like the, the whole idea of planning a day so that we're, okay, like on Thursday, we're going to have this, you know, would you be available to have a discussion about the budget or take a look at it. Um, and I would rather do that together because I know sometimes you've said, you know, will you look at it, thinking that might be better for me, but I think I'd rather do it with you. But no in advance, and that will help decrease my anxiety. Okay. You have to listen. I have to know you understand me. He's not going to get out of it. <laughs> so uh, I do understand that Previous occupants have been very controlling with the money, and for you to have anything nice, you had to stash money away. And uh, uh, I have not necessarily been uh, gentle about trying to get you to participate in our budgeting, and that you'd like to take a day and do that occasionally, maybe on a monthly basis, to be able to uh, sit down and do that together. Does that sound right? Sounds good. Okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so. <laughs> and we're actually gonna do that. So it's funny when you table something like that, you know it's intense, and of course we're a little bit on our best behavior here, but that actually is, is pretty much the way it would go if we were gonna have that conversation outside of this room. Um, also knowing that we were gonna talk about it helps too. 
So this is also, we have, have had this conversation before, and uh, at one point, I let it fester for maybe a month because it was really bugging me. And, uh, and finally I tried to have this conversation in this way. And I had just let it go for so long that we had the conversation, but all it did was relieve pressure. It didn't actually come to a conclusion because we had let it go so long. I had let it go so long before bringing it up. So we had it then, and, and it relieved a little pressure, but it didn't actually come to any solution. And uh, this may happen with you also, where you have to have the conversation more than once to get to the point of being able to have some kind of fruitful uh, resolution. And I have to tell you that an element that was really key for me in this was understanding that it wasn't just about numbers for him or feeling like he, you know, it's just messing up my numbers. It's, you know, and I, I have to do this right and it's very important to me, you know, to have this and be responsible. I mean, there was a whole lot more to it that I didn't understand. Like about trust, that was a big thing. That the fact that he felt that I didn't trust him, which was actually true not because of anything he did, but because of my own issues. Suddenly I wasn't trusting him with this money um, because of my stuff, right? My issues, my past issues. So that was really helpful to me right now also. I have a better understanding, and because I have a better understanding, I'm actually going to have this discussion. <laughs> I'm actually going to do this with him. I feel a whole lot better about facing this kind of hard discussion and this hard thing that we're going to be putting in place for months to come. So it was very helpful. Um, hopefully that helped you to kind of see what that looks like.